It's, uh, it's hard coming back here after, like, you know, not preaching last week. It, it's hard getting back into the, the anointing and, and bringing forth the word and, and trying to hear what God's wanting us to know this morning. And, and just a lot of pressure. So anyway, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll get there in just a moment. Let me explain a little bit what's been going on. So, of course, we had the singing last week. Uh, so we didn't have a message. But the week before, God um, shared the vision uh, with us. The vision being that, you know, he's ready, but are we? Are we ready for the Lord's return like we say we really are, right? We, do we even understand what that looks like? Do we even know how that applies to each and every one of our lives? And, and so this morning, we're going to kind of look at the application uh, more so. Um, if you take notes, as all right, but the, the title of today's message would be, It's One Thing to Believe, But It's Another to Apply. It's one thing to believe, but it's another thing to apply. And that's what we're going to look at today is, is the application thereof. We're, we're still talking about the resurrection. And yesterday, after spending the entire day in the Lord's presence and studying, uh, I think we're going to be moving to the rapture. And, and what the Word talks about with the rapture, the, is it going to be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? There's actually another type of trib coming that we'll, we'll look at I didn't even know about. But after about 13 pages of notes yesterday, uh, I'm finally realizing that we're going to be going into the timelines after we learn about the resurrection here uh, momentarily. We're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 for a couple weeks, and then after that, uh, we're going to go flowing right into it. Like I said before, yes, we're going to talk about hell, Hades, um, paradise. What's all these words mean, Sheol? Uh, what are these words? What, is it, what does it mean? And, and we will look at that, define all of that as we begin to continue to, to unravel uh, the knowledge concerning the end times. And again, uh, it, it's very difficult, especially learning about the, as we go into studying, uh, what does the scripture say about the rapture? What does the scripture say concerning resurrection? Are they one of the same? It's very difficult because you've heard so many different scenarios taught over centuries. And, and, and what we're doing is we're removing all of our opinions. And we're looking strictly at what the Word of God says. And that's what we should be doing. And so anyway, uh, we'll finish up 1 Corinthians in a couple weeks, and then we will dive into that. So 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. And so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We just went over those two scriptures, but I want to kind of catch us up on this. Um, again, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church because they don't necessarily believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believe in resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that he rose from the dead, and they believe in the gospel, what we just read. They believe the gospel. They, they receive the gospel, and they stand on the gospel. But what they do not believe is their own resurrection. They do not believe the resurrection of the dead. So what we've got to understand is chapter 15 is Paul, and he is the whole time is talking about the resurrection, as we will see coming coming weeks. The entire chapter is based on the resurrection to let them know that, you know what, you believe half of it, but you don't believe the whole thing. And the reason why is it becomes with the application. So the Lord was telling me earlier this morning, he said, um, what you believe is what you be apply. What you believe is what you apply. So whatever you believe in your life should look in your lifestyle and how you walk with the Lord. And, and so what I find amazing is this, guys. The whole chapter 15 is, is about the resurrection. But what does he start off with? The gospel. Why? Why would you start with the gospel if the entire time you're talking about the resurrection? Well, because Paul has to lay down a foundation first. And, and, and so I believe that this might be my last day of, of actually kind of preaching. We're going to flow into more teaching from here on out. But I just really feel uh, a quickening in my spirit, if you will, an unctioning of the spirit that we have to really apply today's lesson to our life. We have to really hear what God has to say to each and every one of us to see what we truly do believe. 
You see, again, here he is, he's talking about the gospel, and he's saying, look, if you don't believe in the gospel, then you're not going to believe in in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're not going to believe in your own resurrection. And and so what I find amazing is this. He said, um, the gospel which you have received, and you are saved, it says, I preach to you unless you believed in vain. And and so what I'm, I'm trying to figure out is this. What is it that they didn't believe? Unless you believe in vain means this. It means you have, there's no effect, it serves no purpose in your life, and there's no result of what you believe. So what I'm trying to understand is this. They, they receive the gospel, they stand on the gospel, but yet there's no effect of the gospel in their life. There's no result of believing what they believe in their lives. Now I want to ask us as a church right now, what you believe is it showing forth in your lifestyle and your walk with God? You see, they believe in the resurrection of Jesus. They believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believe that. That's what made them Christians. Yes, we believe that. But what they did not believe is that it applied to their lives. You see, and this is what God wants to ask us today. You, first of all, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again? Praise God. Now, the second part of that is this. Have you applied Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to your own life? Because I'm afraid that sometimes we have not actually fully received that. And what I mean is you believe it, but you don't necessarily receive it or apply it into your life. Like, like what I'm, I'm asking is this. How has Jesus' death affected you? Well, well, let's look real quick. Because Paul kind of explains this as he goes on. Look at verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, now, hold on. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 1 for a moment. I want to show you something. Go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, and you'll see it at verse 11. Again, guys, it's, it's one thing to believe, but it's a whole other thing to apply. And again, the Corinthian church believed in Jesus' resurrection, but they didn't believe in their own resurrection. And so Paul sees that. The Holy Spirit reveals that to Paul. And so now he is pointing out where their flaw lies, and that is actually in the true belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not, not that they don't believe that he did it, but the belief of how it applies to their own life. Look at Galatians 1, verse 11. It says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, uh, we know his story, I'm not going to go into it, but on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ, a living encounter with him. And on the, the, this encounter with Jesus Christ, the revelation of who Jesus was came to him. And that's what he's saying, look, I didn't need no man to teach me. When you receive the revelation from Jesus Christ himself, things become more real to you. And this is what the Lord said later on. He said, without revelation, there is no application. So let me, let me say these things together. What you believe is what you b- apply. However, without revelation, there is no application. And so what, what this is saying today to us is this. Ooh, I'm having difficult today, guys. God, pray with me. So what, what, what the Lord is saying to all of us today is this. You can know the Word of God. You can believe the Word of God. But if there is no revelation of the Word of God that there would be no application in your life. Does that make sense? So when you read the Word of God, you can believe every line upon line and precept upon precept is true. You can believe it all. But unless you have revelation that is written for you personally, then you will not apply what the Word says to your life. For instance, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give us a what? Fear, but a power and a love to sound mind. All right? We believe that scripture, right? We know it. The only thing I had to start is by the same part of it, and you can finish it. You have it memorized. But do you apply that to your life? 
In, in other words, are you the type of Christian that's going around like this going, Lord, I hope so. Because if, if that's the case, you have not received the revelation that God truly did not give you a spirit of fear. You, you, do, you don't have that revelation. You know you believe that God can do that for you, but you haven't received it for your own self. You believe that God did not give you a spirit of fear. You believe that God did not give you a spirit of fear. And you see it in other people's lives. You see the boldness. You see the courage. You see God pouring into their lives. But yet you're like, I know he can do it for you all, but did he do it for me? Because you haven't lived it. You haven't received the revelation because you haven't sought the revelation for yourself. It, a lot of times, like, as you all know, you know, in the military, I was an alcoholic. I don't care. I'll, I'll put it out there. That man is dead. We'll see you in a minute. I, I'll talk about him all I want. I could care less about that guy. I was. I was an alcoholic. But guess what? When I, believe, when I began to read the Word of God, and I sought, sought instruction and revelation of the Word, I, just, I didn't want it just to read it as a story. I wanted to read it as an application for my life. I began to realize then that, you know what? If the blood of Christ comes upon my life, that means every chain is broken. Because there's nothing greater or more powerful on my life than that of the blood of Christ. So then tell me, how can I still be an alcoholic if I had the blood of Christ on my life? At some point, it becomes a, a choice for me, right? Remember, we read this, I think, a couple of weeks ago in the book of Acts. When Paul and Silas... When they were in prison, and the chains were not broken, but they were loosed. They easily could just whoop, right? When, when our addictions, when, when the blood of Christ comes upon our addictions, our, cha our chains become loosed. And it becomes a choice at that point. What do you do right from there? Do you remain in the prison, shackled because of the lie of the enemy? Or do you go, I'm out of here. You see, it's one thing for you to believe the Word of God. It's a whole other thing for you to apply it to your life. And the reason why the church is sick and weak today all over this world is because they believe the Word of God, but they haven't asked for revelation of how it applies to their life personally so that they, wait, they can apply the power of the Word on their life. Does it make any sense whatsoever? I feel like I am just treading today. So... Here he is. He's saying, look, for I, go back to verse 3, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. All right, so the, the whole chapter of, of chapter 15 is based on the resurrection. He starts out this chapter talking about the gospel because he sees the flaw in their belief. He sees that they believe the gospel, but they haven't truly applied the gospel to their lives. And we're going to break that down in just a minute to where it makes more sense. But here he is. He says, first I deliver to you, first all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What's the first part of the gospel? First part is death. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Now, I like this part He's, because he makes sure he puts in here, according to the scriptures, He's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about how Jesus fulfilled prophecy of the Old Testament, showing that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah. Let's go ahead and make sure we apply that first. Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah, and this is what Paul is talking about, according to the Scriptures. So, and he goes on, and he says, verse 4, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Not only did he die according to the scriptures, but he was buried according to the scriptures, and he rose the third day according to the scriptures. So everything that took place in his life was prophecy out of the Old Testament. Amen? So what you believe is what you apply, but without revelation, there's no application. So Paul is trying to establish their belief in the gospel, first and foremost, so he can present the resurrection, the truth of the resurrection to them. So what's happening here, guys, is this. He is presenting the gospel in a way that he's like, look, you believe it, but have you applied the gospel to your own life? And, and what I mean by that is this. What is he saying back in verse 3? Um, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. So, 
you believe that Christ died. You, you believe that he died for your sins. All right. How has that affected you? This is where we're going to go really deep for a moment. You believe Christ died. You believe he died on the cross. And that as well. You should. But how has that affected you? Remember he said, unless you believe in vain, he told the Corinthians, you believe this, but unless you believe in vain, in, in other words, unless there's no effect of it on your life. So why, number one, why did Jesus die? He died for our sins. He died so that we could become justified in the Father's eyes. He died so that he could save us from God's wrath. So he died for our, to give us salvation, right? So the key of the question today is this. Is that what you believe? And number two, is that what you apply to your life? What does that look like if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? You see, it should show in your lifestyle that you truly are saved. That's the type of effect that first part of the gospel should have on your life. If you truly believe the gospel then you should truly actually live out the gospel to others around you. Again, people that I was stationed with before don't even recognize me now. Because I used to be known as the fish who drinks too much. And now I'm the fish who don't drink. Because I, I, that's no longer who I am. We'll see this again in a minute. Fishers of men, right? You see... New creation. New cre you don't realize how prophetic that is. So anyway, w when I died, all that old is gone. I should not recognize the man that Christ died for. I, and I say this all the time, but I'll say it again. I should resemble the man that Christ is living for. Because Christ is living, right? Right? I should not be the man that he died on the cross for because that should no longer be who I am. When I believe the truth of the gospel, then I should be like, you know what? He died to set me free from my own sins and give me eternal life. So therefore, should I be walking around like, oh man, I hope I'm saved. I'm preaching to myself right now. No. We should be walking around like, hey, you know what? This is just temporary. Where I'm about to go is eternal. I'm about to see Jesus face to face. I should be excited. I shouldn't care if there's low gas or whatever the case may be. Who cares? Maybe I need to stay more time at home anyway instead of burning gas. You see, we got to understand the gospel when it's applied to your life should change your whole perspective. You should no longer worry. Those old cravings is a lie from the pit of hell. Because that's not who you are anymore. Those old cravings, everything that, oh, come on now, let's get some truth in here. Everything that the enemy is tempting you with doesn't even apply to you. Because that's not who you are anymore. The old drinks, the whoremongering, whatever the case may be, the pornography, let's speak the truth. I came across a statistic the other day. You realize that pornography doesn't only affect men, right? And inside the church, you know, is a high percentage that men and women of Christian, Christian men and women are bound under pornography. Did you know that? But when the blood of Christ comes upon our life, those temptations are no longer for you. As a matter of fact, you should no longer be, be felt those those temptations but now you should begin to feel the desires of god in your life let's take a little bit deeper because this is this is where i got stuck i asked you all a couple um a couple of y'all questions about this and i'm still not fully satisfied about the revelation i got yet but so we know that there is a reason we need to believe that christ died on the cross because it, it gave us salvation from his his wrath right and that's how we apply it to our life. How about, and that he was buried. What's that got to do with anything, right? He died. And he rose. Shouldn't that be good enough? 
What is the significance of Jesus being buried in the tomb? Same power, right? Well, remember, without revelation, there's no application, right? So are you allowing the burial of Jesus Christ to affect your life today? And what I mean by that, turn with me to John chapter, it's not going to be up here, the Lord showed me a little while ago. Go with me to John chapter 19 for a second. John chapter 19. When revelation becomes application, I'm going to show you in the Word of God where revelation becomes application. John chapter 19. And while you turn there, I'm not going to tell you exactly. It's going to be at the end of chapter 19. I want you to go ahead at first. But let me ask you something. If I asked you, Jesus died on the, what would you say? Cross. Jesus died on the cross. Then I would ask you, Jesus was buried in the? tomb all right that's our belief jesus died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb right okay so what does that have to do with us without revelation there is no application so what does that have to do with me how does it affect my lifestyle now knowing that jesus was buried okay he was buried he was dead he you know what what's that got to do look at john chapter 19 verse 41 john 19 41 it says this. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Okay. So let me ask you another question. What location did sin enter the earth? The garden. And what location was the power of sin broken in the garden? At what point was sin laid to rest? In the garden. What, what does that have to do with us? Go back to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to show you a little bit where we're going to be going the next couple of weeks. Look at verse... Uh, 36. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36. So why is it important that Jesus died and was buried in the garden? It says, Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. And look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in incorruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. The power of sin came in through the garden. Jesus broke the power of sin on Calvary, which it says was located in a garden. He was buried in a tomb that was located in a garden. You see the spiritual significance of this? And then, why is that significant? Because what is buried is buried one thing, but when it's raised, is raised a whole different thing. How does that apply to our life? Turn one more time to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, what does it say? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He was raised incorruptible. Spiritually speaking, how does this apply to our lives? As we will see in just a moment, Romans 6, we were baptized in the death of Christ and when we were buried we were buried that old person in him and then it says we should be newness of life today is how we should be walking in a newness of life so let's talk about Lazarus and, and Jesus just for a second before we, we begin to close this thing today what's the difference here 
Lazarus was raised from the dead, but Jesus was resurrected from the dead. When Lazarus was raised from the dead, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out of the tomb, right? Because he's wrapped. What's the first thing that Jesus says as he comes out of the tomb? Loose him, because he still has his grave clothes on. Why? Because that one day he would need those grave clothes again. But when everyone showed up at the tomb and they peeked in at the tomb, what did they find? They found the grave clothes. They found the grave clothes of Jesus. Why? Because he wouldn't need them again. You see, guys, when I'm, the way we apply this spiritually to our lives, how does the burial affect our lives the burial of Christ, how should that affect us today, spiritually speaking, is this. When, when you are baptized in the death of Christ, it says that you are buried. We'll look at it in just a moment, and we'll finish. And you are buried in him. When you come out of that water in newness of life, spiritually speaking, those old grave clothes should be in your old spiritual tomb. You know, what, what wrapped you, what represented the dead person of you, your mistakes, your failures, your addictions, all whatever that case may be, what wrapped you as you went in that tomb should stay in that tomb. As you come out, you should realize that old stuff that was attached to you as you went in that tomb should no longer be attached to you. Your identity should no longer be attached to you today. The alcoholic is no longer who you are. The drug addict is no longer who you are. The whoremonger is no longer who you are. When you come out of that grave, spiritually speaking, you are something brand new in Christ. So the question is then, do you, are you applying the effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ into your own personal life? More than just, I believe the gospel. No, you can believe the gospel, but are you applying it to your life through the revelation that on that cross, Jesus was in a garden, defeating the power of sin on your life, meaning that now when we sin, it actually becomes a choice for us. Do you believe that the power of sin is broken in your life? All right, tough question. Are we applying that? Is there any effect of sin in your life today? If so, then we've got to ask ourselves, why if the power of sin was broken on the cross? And if I'm no longer that old person, I should no longer be an alcoholic, right? Because I'm coming out of the cross today. So I'm coming out of the tomb on me. So that's no longer who I am. So let's finish it up. I kept you long enough. And it says, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we know how his death affects us. We know how the burial of Jesus affects us. So how about the resurrection of Jesus? How does that affect us? Well, we know someday soon that if we believe that Jesus died, buried, and rose again, we too will be. And that's what Paul is establishing here in 1 Corinthians. He's like, if you believe the gospel, then you must believe in the resurrection of the dead. In other words, your own resurrection. Oh, this is what, he, listen to this. I love this. So when Jesus rose... Was he, a, was he a ghost? He had bodily form, right? He says, touch my flesh and touch my bones. I, I want you to see I'm still a human, right? And I asked the Lord why. What was the purpose of him rising as a human being still? And this is what he said. He was glorified yet fleshly because uh, he had to prove the power of sin and death and the grave was broken. If he just came out as a ghost, it would just show that he was merely existing. But when you come out like this, but yet glorified, we'll look at that later on in the next couple of teachings. It shows that there is a power in your life. That you're walking in the power of Christ over death, over sin, and over the grave. I want to ask you, has, is that affecting you today, knowing that? Is your life forever changed? Knowing that, you know what? All this is temporary. That when, when the trumpet calls, and if I'm, if I'm dead and gone, I know that's not my last place. My body just be resting. I'll be, 
I'll be with the Lord until then anyway. We'll look at that later. But let me, let me finish this up with this thought. Finally, turn with me to Romans chapter 6, just so I could tie this in and we're done. Romans 6 and we'll be done. Again, you believe the gospel, but have you applied the gospel to your own life? Romans 6, look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may, be, may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? Death. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. What is, what is Paul talking about? The gospel, right? Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And now he goes into the effect, and where this is where we're done. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. The life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So, with that whole train wreck, let me finish this right here. You believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we all should. We believe that Jesus died on the cross. We believe that he was buried in the tomb. And we believe that he rose on the third day. Okay. That's good and all, but have you applied that to your life to where now the gospel has a full effect on you in your own life, in your, your relationship with God, in your lifestyle with God? In other words, do you truly believe that Christ broke the power of sin on your life? So if you believe that, then you should therefore be walking in newness of life to where you are no longer sinning. Doing the old things, what I'm saying is doing the old things that you used to do, that the Word of God clearly tells us not to do anymore. Do you believe that he, he was buried? Yes. Okay, how has that affected your life? Knowing that those old grave clothes of yours should still be in the spiritual tomb, that that's not who you are anymore. That when you come out of your spiritual tomb, you have a new identity in Christ. It's no longer you live, it's Christ in you. You should no longer be recognizable to your old friends. As a matter of fact, you asked my wife, when I first got saved, I had to get rid of all of my friends. Because they kept on trying to pull me back in and pull me back in. I did truly separate myself and come out from among them. And then finally, the resurrection. Have you truly applied the resurrection of Christ on your own personal life? In other words, are you walking a new life now, not with worry and looking back, but with excitement as you look ahead, knowing that Christ is on his way, guys? He can be here at any moment. And what you're worrying about today, what you have drugged through those doors today, is going to be insignificant when we stand before our God in his glory. So your altar call is this. As you go home and you think about it, I want to ask you to look in yourself. Number one, ask yourself, do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus died, rose, died, buried, and rose again? And number two, how does that look in your life. If you truly believe those things, then how is that affecting your life today?
Because according to Paul, as he's speaking to the Corinthians, they should be walking like they're resurrected already. There's a new life that they're walking. And knowing that one day soon, this old wretched body is finally going to die, praise God. And I will have a new body, a glorified body that can praise Jesus for eternity. Ask yourselves, amen? Let's pray, Father.